Yeah, we're here with Terry Gregg, the CEO of Dexcom. Thank you for, thank you for joining us. Oh, good morning. Thanks for having me. So you just reported your second quarter earnings. Uh, did pretty well, right? Yeah, we did. We were up 64% year over year, 25% sequentially from the first quarter. Great. We'll get into that uh, later on more in detail. So I thought we'd step back, and for those who aren't familiar with you, um, your background, you, you make a continuous glucose monitor for diabetics. Correct. What, what is that? Well, continuous glucose sensing is the ability to deliver a glucose measurement continuously on a handheld receiver. So rather than having to prick your finger, or put a drop of blood on a strip, we stream that wirelessly, that information to the patient so they can visualize that at any point in time. They just simply look at their receiver, hit a button, and it will tell them not only what their glucose is, but where it's trending. So we have arrows indicating rise and fall of glucose as well as alerts and alarms that are settable for the patient so they don't run into either dangerously low glucose or dangerously high glucose. And we'll, uh, we'll discuss why the, the, uh, the physiology of that in a second, but what you sell is a razor, razor blade, so there's a, uh, explain please the part that actually implants under the skin and then the more uh, durable handheld. Sure, yeah, we run about 70% disposable, 30% durable, so the razor, razor blade um, kind of uh, selling concept. It's a, a thin uh, wire that resides, patient administered, resides just beneath the surface of the skin. It's impregnated with certain enzymes and then we put a transmitter on top of that and that transmits then to a handheld receiver today and will transmit actually to a, a phone in the future. Oh, so um, you might uh, eliminate the current uh, receiver and, and, and make it a software that's on a phone? Right, Our, so today we're Gen 4 Platinum mm -hmm. is the, the product that is commercialized. And by the end of the year, we will file with the Food and Drug Administration our Gen 5 platform, which is transmitting that information directly to a smartphone. We do that today uh, through a product called Share that is pending before the FDA right now, but it actually is an intermediary to a follow-on phone. In the future, we'll go directly to the phone. All right. Um, now, obviously, finger sticks are painful and so forth, but what what is the advantage of a, of a CGM over, in addition to just avoiding painful finger sticks? Explain uh, the, that. Please. Yeah, the, the real advantage is the understanding of speed and direction of glucose. Mm -hmm. So if you have a finger stick measurement as an example, it's a static measurement. Right. Let's say it's 200 milligrams. You don't know what you were an hour ago. If you were 100 an hour ago means you're going up. Probably should take some insulin. But if you were 300 an hour ago, you're coming down. Probably shouldn't take any insulin until you figure out where you're going to bottom out. That's the problem that's, is the that's static the acute, measurement. The acute emergency you want to avoid is low glucose. Uh, absolutely. I mean, hypoglycemia has a cognitive impairment, unconsciousness, and the potentiality of death in an acute fashion. Obviously, hyperglycemia or elevated glucose has all of the long-term microvascular complications commonly associated with diabetes. So what CGM does, it gives you instantaneous information, and it's a feedback system. If you eat something, I assure you, even as a non-diabetic, you're going to see the reaction of what you've consumed or the stress, physical stress, mental stress. All of those types of stresses have an impact on a, a person's uh, glucose levels, the rise and fall. So you can't get that information because there's no trend, no alarms from finger stick measurements and CGM gives you the entire picture. So uh, papers in the New England Journal and so forth have shown that CGM has a better outcome how it, it, it avoiding events like, like hypoglycemia or longer term hemoglobin A1C. Why is CGM better? Well CGM uh, again certainly reduces the uh, HbA1c or glycosylated hemoglobin which has been linked to all the long-term complications. So you reduce that. The challenge for patients of trying to reduce that is you, uh, unfortunately, the bar for, from high and low goes lower, which means that patients run the risk of going into hypoglycemia. Mm -hmm. CGM allows patients to achieve <clears throat> a better HbA1c or glycosylated hemoglobin without the risk of hypoglycemia. So the New England Journal of Medicine that you mentioned 
talked about the ability to achieve that, and even those patients already achieving a low HbA1c through intensive management did not see an increase in hypoglycemia when they were treated with CGM over a long period of time. <clears throat> okay. Now, um, on the conference call, a lot of questions were about the pediatric market. I was a little surprised by that because to me, when I think of type 1 diabetes, I think of almost all of them start as a pediatric age patient. But are you say is it now that your devices are mostly in adults over age 25 because of a reimbursement issue and that you're just now getting into the pediatric market? Uh, not exactly, and, and why I say that is that we're approved down to age two. Okay. So before that approval at age 25 was the, um, well age 18 was the approval. FDA approval. FDA approval. Many of the uh, payers, commercial payers, had a, a basis of because the, the results you had to be an adult that were published in the New England. That okay. said, even before we got FDA approval, about 8 to 10 percent of our installed base were less than age 18, and we had no issues with getting them coverage, even though it wasn't a formal coverage policy. Okay. We actually did, in fact, have them covered. So when we got the approval earlier this year for pediatrics, it was just a follow-on oh, okay. to an, uh, the so an adult F approval. an FDA event, not a Medicare event, is now it, helping it, you get into the pediatric market. It, yeah, it was an FDA event mm -hmm. because the other challenge mm -hmm. was that our sales force could not call on pediatric right. endocrinologists. So when okay. post-approval, now there's you know some 800 to 1,000 pediatric endocrinologists that we are now able to call on. And obviously, we've seen our installed base go from eight to ten percent that as I mentioned on the earnings call we're now seeing twenty five to thirty percent of our shipments going out to patients that are under the age of eighteen. Okay.